I want to say hello to everyone and welcome to today's session. My name is Marta De Gia. I am a SINGAP parent and director of the SINGAP Research Fund. Uh, we are very excited to continue the SRF SINGAP Research Fund webinar series. The goal of the series is to empower your communications with clinicians as you get more clear knowledge of SINGAP. We also want to plug you to our next presentation. SINGAP mod modulates the bodies biological clock, what SYNGAP mice can tell us about light and sleep, which will take place on June 10 and 10 a.m. Pacific time with Sydney Atten, PhD. Our talk today is type of seizures and EEG patterns in SYNGAP 1. I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Angel Aledo Serrano. Dr. Aledo Serrano is a neurologist and epileptologist at two comprehensive epilepsy centers in Spain, Hospital Ruber International in Madrid and Clinica Corachan in Barcelona. He focuses his clinical practice and research in complex epilepsies, both in pediatric and adult patients. He's currently working on epilepsy surgery, genetic epilepsies, and developmental encephalopathies. He's involved in multiple clinical trials of precision medicine. He's highly active as a scientific advisor of rare disease and collaborate with patients advocacy groups like ours. Uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the SRF website under webinars on the family menu. By then, of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to get the answer to your questions. We love to hear from you. Please write your questions in the Q&A. For those of you just joining us, welcome. And again, our speaker today is Dr. Angel Aledo Serrano, and his talk is Types of Seizures and EEG Patterns in SYNGAP 1. And now it's my pleasure to give it to Dr. Serrano, Aledo Serrano, okay. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for having me. Thank you all the SYNGAP Research Fund uh, uh, team for inviting me. I think you are, you are doing really a great job because we need uh, a lot of dissemination in this, uh, in this uh, area uh, of uh, genetic epilepsies, of developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, uh, we need more awareness and more research, and, and we need you. Uh, this is really important. So uh, I'm going to, to talk about types of seizures, uh, how, uh, how are seizures in, in Singapore, no? and also uh, how important is electro, electroencephalography uh, in, this, uh, in this population. I'm sorry for my strong Spanish accent. I, I hope you, you understand me uh, uh, fair enough. So this is the classification of, of seizures and this, uh, also the classification of uh, epilepsy types. You know, uh, classically, traditionally, we were using a classification of epilepsies uh, using only the information of whether the, the, whether the seizures were focal, uh, if only a part of the, of the brain was involved, or uh, if, the, if the seizures were generalized, when uh, bilateral, uh, quickly bilateral of the whole brain uh, was spiking at the, at the same time. Uh, so now in the last classification in 2017, we have the etiology part, which is uh, more and more important. And the genetic part, we know, uh, is uh, important for more than 70% of uh, people with epilepsy. And Singapore is one of the examples. So we, we have like also a traditional classification of uh, epi epileptic encephalopathies, West syndrome, lenos gastos syndrome, Dravet syndrome. All of those uh, were uh, based only in EEG, uh, electroencephalography, and semiology of seizures. So all the genetic uh, information we have now, it's, it's 
sometimes it's uh, difficult to, to uh, get into these traditional classifications. So sometimes we, I would say, we force the syndrome uh, to get into our patient. So we call it like Dravet-like syndrome or lenos gasto like syndrome or Red-like syndrome because these traditional syndromes are not useful for every patient. So the genetic information is uh, more and more important. And this is something we know is not something uh, really rare. So in the last few years, in the last two or three years, we are deciphering uh, the, the so-called uh, epidemiological aspects of genetic epilepsies. And we know uh, that a lot of patients with, with epilepsy uh, who are starting with seizures in the first years of life uh, have a genetic uh, background which is the cause of the, of the disease. So we have like two models. Uh, I would say one model, which is the, the model of uh, Dravet syndrome, which is a success model because Dravet syndrome was a traditional, a classical or uh, classical uh, epileptic syndrome. And uh, most of patients with Dravet syndrome have a, a positive mutation in SCN1A. Uh, however, uh, all of these SCM2A, CDKL5, STXBP1, or SYNGAP1, uh, they don't show uh, a specific uh, traditional syndrome. So it's better to go reverse and to define new syndromes, new features of uh, epileptic seizures and semiologies uh, regarding the specific mutations. So we, we could say that there, there were like three stages of phenotyping and semiologies in epilepsy. Uh, the first classic one was only taking in account the electroclinical syndromes, the EEG. Then during the uh, 90s uh, and the, the last decade, uh, using neuroimaging and uh, stereo EEG, invasive EEG, we could also know some new features of semiology of, of seizures and epilepsy. And the last wave or the last stage uh, is genetics, is the, is the area or the field in epilepsy which is growing uh, faster and faster in the last uh, years. So single one is, is one of the most frequent genetic uh, causes of epilepsy. The first description, uh, curiously, was in 2009. And the first patients uh, described uh, had no epilepsy. That, that's in interesting because uh, actually more than 90% of uh, people with single one have, have epilepsy. And this is uh, one example of something we were talking about previously, that single one encephalopathy, uh, we cannot introduce it, include it in one traditional syndrome, so one traditional epileptic syndrome. This is a nice uh, publication from 2019 in one of the most important journals uh, in the world of uh, neurology, which is the Neurology Journal. Uh, they described uh, from patients from a lot of countries, and they described that most of them had epilepsy, and the, the most frequent uh, age of onset was two years of, of age. This is important, but some patients started at six months, some patients at six, uh, seven years, and uh, they could be include, uh, included in two classical syndromes. Uh, those syndromes, uh, those syndrome, which is an epilepsy with myoclonic atonic seizures. We will see some videos of, the, of these typical seizures. And also uh, Givon syndrome, uh, which is uh, characterized by what, what we call uh, absences with eyelid myoclonia. We will see uh, later on some example of this. So you see some of these patients uh, could not be included in uh, none of the classic uh, epileptic syndromes. If we go reversely, 
So uh, not from the genetics to the syndrome, but to the syndrome, uh, from the syndrome to the genetics, we can see that uh, in this nice publication, it was published last year in 2020, uh, with people with uh, myoclonic atonic seizures, you can see that some of these patients have the uh, genetic test testing positive for single one. So you, you can find single one reversely from syndrome to genetics, from genetics to, to syndrome. So just to have an overview how we classify, uh, how, how we talk about seizures, we have uh, generalized seizures. They are absent seizures, myoclonic seizures, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. We have also focal seizures when uh, there is an area in, in, the, in the brain which is causing uh, mostly the, the seizures. And they could be without an, an impairment of uh, the awareness or with uh, impairment of the awareness. And we have other seizures like epileptic spans uh, or atonic tonic seizures. For example, here we have an spasm. Spans uh, are like that. Sometimes they are in cluster, like uh, some of them in a short period of time. I would like to thank all the families who share uh, their videos for uh, educational and also research purpose. For example, this is an example of focal seizure uh, of laugh. Sometimes seizures are very, very mild and you, you need an EEG to, to see them. For example, this smile was a focal seizure, frontal missile. This is also a typical seizure we can see in, in Singap 1, which is a tonic seizure. You see there's a drop, head drop. During uh, chewing, which is very typical of Singap 1. And you see there, there is also a tonic extension of uh, upper limbs. The patient is this, the father is this. <laughs> so you see, there are also myoclonic seizures. So this, this episode, for example, we could think is a normal myoclonic uh, episode uh, of sl uh, sleeping, which, is, which could be uh, physiological, could be normal. But uh, if you perform an EEG, an electroencephalography during night, sometimes you can uh, catch uh, some of these episodes, which could be uh, also uh, epileptic. This is something quite typical in Singap 1 with photosensitivity and myoclonic seizures. Let's see it again. With the light, you see myoclonic jerking. This is typical for and generalized. And here you have a, an example of tonic tonic seizure, generalized tonic tonic seizure during photosensitivity. So this is important because uh, the main uh, the main seizure which is causing uh, fractures and traumatic injuries are convulsive generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Also, atonic seizures, drop attacks, could uh, cause uh, fractures, also spinal cord uh, and uh, tongue problems. This is a single one patient. You see here, this is the, the signature of I lead my myoclonia. You see there, there is like 
jerking of the eyelid. This is important. I want you to see it properly. You see the eyelid, the myoclonia. It's like, like a subtle jerking with the upward of the of the eyes. Now again. Now again. Sometimes we sometimes in single one we see this that uh, if they are uh, without attention without doing anything they just self provoke uh, seizures. Also we see sometimes seizures which are uh, triggered by uh, visual patterns like this like the uh, shirt the, the drawing of the shirt. So this is the signature of eyelid uh, myoclonia and eye closure sensitivity, we call it. And this is typical of uh, Gibbon syndrome. Do you remember Gibbon syndrome is uh, related to Singa uh, uh, one Some patients uh, with uh, Gibbon uh, syndrome has a genetic testing positive for Singa one And what we see in the, in the electroencephalogram is uh, this is the blinking, so the eye closer. Uh, this is the artifact. And then just after that, we see the generalized discharge. So this is the, the typical uh, electric signature of these uh, patients. And we see uh, this in Gibbon syndrome. This, is, this has been uh, studied for a long time. Uh, that uh, there are some interruption or some dysfunction in the occipital uh, lobes, uh, which are the lobes uh, in charge of proce processing the visual uh, information. So because of that, in Sigma 1, uh, those who, who have a, a Gibbons-like syndrome, uh, they have uh, photosensitivity, light sensitivity, or visual pattern sensitivity, or eye closer sensitivity. So, so this is also something described by my colleague uh, Andres Jimenez Gomez uh, and his team. Uh, they have described some changes in uh, occipital areas uh, in the EEG. Uh, both in the background and in the electrons, uh, in the epileptic discharges. So this is another example of the eye closer signature. You see here what we were talking about, the, the artifact of the eye close, closer. Like we are going to see it again here. You see the artifact of the eye close. You see the eye close. And then just after that, the discharge with a little bit flattering uh, of the of the eyelid, and this is also something we see in Singa one. Sometimes there are pattern sensitivity. This is not very frequent, but we see sometimes uh, pattern sensitivity, and this is something we have to explore during the video EEG monitoring. We uh, show some visual, specific visual uh, patterns uh, with lines, with circles, uh, and so on. And this is also something we, uh, we, we have a, a specific diagnostic tool, uh, which are the Frenzel uh, glasses. Uh, with these glasses, uh, we, we uh, don't allow the patient to fix the, the side. So then uh, we, we can see a fixation of uh, pattern, which, is, uh, which are the uh, epileptic discharges during fixation of. So when the patient cannot uh, fixate the, the side. And this was the case for this uh, girl. So this is also an example. 
here with the tablet, with the screen. Just at the moment, we had an atonic seizure, like losing the tongue and falling behind. We have this pacing again. And this is something interesting because sometimes changes uh, when the seizure starts uh, are very subtle and, and the families are really professional in uh, capturing and, and detecting when the seizure began. And you uh, families sometimes say, uh, we can see there is a subtle change in the, in the face uh, uh, mimic, the face uh, movement. And this is something we can see in, in this pacing. Right now, you see, like the face changes, and uh, that this is an absent seizure. This is something we cannot control or we cannot monitor if, 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 we, if we don't perform uh, a prolonged EEG. And, and, and you see, this is the end of the seizure. And again, she has uh, a normal expression in the face. So the EEG is important, we, we know it. Uh, we, com we could uh, think about what is the best timing for an EEG. Uh, and this is something which, which has been studied for a long time. And we know the best moment for an EEG is just after uh, a seizure. So if you have a, uh, if the patient has a, a seizure, uh, if you perform an EEG in the 12 hours after, you, we will see uh, more changes and uh, it would be more useful. And for how long, it could be the, another question, for how long is better to perform a, an EEG? So we know uh, it's better uh, as long as we can. So uh, 12 hours is better than four hours and 24 hours maybe is the best uh, to get some information regarding uh, subtle seizures, discharges uh, during sleep uh, and so on. So this is another single one patient. You can see that uh, during drinking or during chewing, you can have a seizures like, like this. This is a tonic seizure. and it was triggered by uh, uh, drinking. And this is, yeah, something which has been described typically in, in single one, the eating epilepsy, sometimes it's also drinking uh, epilepsy, which is users uh, provoked by this. But this is important. We were really, really uh, into the concept of epileptic encephalopathy that uh, seizures and discharges uh, could produce uh, developmental delay and cognitive problems. But now we know that sometimes uh, the cause is not epilepsy and uh, it's just that we have a cause, a genetic uh, mutation like Singa Guang, and uh, the mutation has different uh, symptoms. One of them could be the epilepsy and uh, the others could be developmental delay, motor dysfunction, cognitive uh, problems. Uh, but the epilepsy is not the main character producing the developmental delay. It's more the etiology, the, the cause, the genetic cause, which is uh, in the background. So because of that, I, I always uh, like uh, talking about this, the quaternary prevention, you know, uh, I, I like the, the cognitive aspects uh, or cognitive bias uh, we uh, doctors have when we treat patients and families. And uh, you know, as doctors, we like prescribing. We want to give pills, we want to treat everything, but sometimes we have to, uh, you know, to take care of our emotions and uh, about our anxiety treating our patients and try to decrease the medication 
in, in some situations because we have we can have what, what we call the prescription cascade because sometimes you start with a drug, you produce a new, a new medical condition, which could be a new adverse event. Then you start another drug for the medical condition, which, which was caused by the first drug. So you are uh, producing more and more problems uh, regarding this. So then sometimes we, we have to be more precise, perform uh, EEG in our patients, uh, slow down, uh, taking care of the details, and sometimes deprescribe. So uh, take out some medications uh, if we don't see any ben benefit in, in our patients. And that's epilepsy precision medicine. We have to uh, look for uh, specific uh, theologies. We have to look for specific patterns in EEG and to choose better and wiser uh, our uh, prescriptions. But for that, in order to, to get precision medicine, we have to uh, perform more prolonged EEG, better MRI in some patients, and of course, genetic testing. But we know there is a huge gap, get diagnostic gap. Uh, this is something we have studied in our, in our team. Uh, the, diagnos the diagnostic gap in people with uh, epilepsy and uh, intellectual disability with uh, probably genetic epilepsies. And we know adult patients, uh, they are not studied well. They, 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 will, they were not studied when, when, when they were, when they were uh, children because we didn't know the genetic causes of, uh, of epilepsy. And we have to update uh, this workup and uh, perform more genetic testing. So this is all. Uh, I wanted to conclude with this. Epilepsy is one of the main features of SINGAP1 related disorders. Uh, some characteristics are very specific, very, very typical, uh, like uh, the G-wing G -wing epilepsy, the g ones and those uh, overlapping syndromes, but some, sometimes uh, the patients have, have not a really specific epilepsy. They have myoclonic seizures, for example, and this is quite typical for other genetic diseases. And uh, I think video EEG is really important to, to be more, more in deep in our patients, to study them uh, better and to, to give a better decision making uh, for for drug uh, uh, choosing, so this is all. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question you have. Thank you very much. That I can tell you already, this webinar will become one of our greatest hits. Um, and I think it's important <laughs> for people to know this the the story of this webinar. We we had a we had a um, congreso científico in February where you were one of the speakers and you gave this presentation there and it was so popular we we asked you if you'd give it in English so that's why we're here um, we knew this would be good thank you yeah. so much for that and thank you for all of the care you give to our Syngap kids and all the other kids with with these genetic diseases our patients are lucky to have you um, I have a lot of questions and I want to encourage the audience. Uh, I know we have clinicians and researchers and parents and please just everybody ask your questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, can you talk more? So there's one question that's already from, in from Mr. Sachin um, and he says, how can we treat genetic epilepsy? Please ad advise first line drug. And in addition to answering that question, I want to, I want to add two things on the Syngap flavor. I see a lot of patients who are on um, was not a lot. Some of our patients present with eyelid myoclonia. Somewhere in the literature, it says eyelid myoclonia or absence, I think it says absence seizures, ethosuximide. So they start on ethosuximide. Doesn't work. Or the seizures get worse. Add Lamictal. Doesn't work. Seizures get worse. Epidiolex. So I, I literally, two days ago, I was talking to a family on these three drugs. Epidiolex, ethosuximide, Lamictal. And they're like, maybe we should add Onfi. And as somebody who is, and I recognize your job is very hard, and I'm glad you're doing it. But my question for you and, and neurologists is always, and this is related to your prescription cascade point, 
neurologists seem to be very good at adding another drug. How much do you guys talk about, maybe quietly in the corners at conferences, about taking away drugs that seem to have done nothing, but are still flowing around these little kids and, you know, doing something, you know? Sorry, yeah. that's a hard question, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We have to be self-conscious about this all uh, cognitive bias and all the, all our uh, psychological aspects. You know, when when we uh, do the our decision making during clinical practice, and uh, yeah, you you are you are completely right. Yeah, it's it's very difficult for us to go back uh, to take perspective. Uh, to i don't know to destroy your own narrative in your case <laughs> it's like you are uh, having uh, decisions and it's it's difficult to change them uh, but for sure this is a direction we we have to go through we have to uh, decrease the medication in general because sometimes we are treating electroencephalography and we are not treating patients we are not treating families and we have to change it and uh, uh, think more about uh, quality of life, think more about sleep, think more about uh, behavior, because this is something uh, the other side. Uh, sometimes you are treating seizures and you are improving seizures, but the behavior is uh, worse. So uh, that that's, does not make sense. So, yeah. So then we agree. <laughs> we agree. Yeah. That. And of yeah. course, you know, my opinion is unwelcome because I am not a doctor, unlike yourself or, or, or Marta. But I still ask them, I'm like, are we sure this is not too many drugs in any way? No. Um, but Mr. Sachin's question is interesting, and I think a lot of people have it. Is there a first line drug for a genetic epilepsy? Uh, in general, for genetic epilepsy? That, that's, that's the question, yeah. Yeah. Uh really really hard question <laughs> uh, so i would say when you don't know how to treat your patient normally you start with valproic valproic because there are really few uh, genetic causes uh, which ca which could uh, worsen with valproic there are some of them like uh, mitochondrial uh, some metabolic diseases could, uh, could worsen with Valproic, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, the less less bad in general. So if, if I have to, to start with one drug at the beginning, uh, I would start with that. But I, will, I would perform a fast genetic testing. And this is something we have to ask for. Uh, now we, in, in our hospital, we have the possibility to have the, the genetic testing in one, one week and a half. Uh, the results. So I think this is something we have to fight for. Yeah. Agreed. Then uh, extrapolating that to Singap, are you still thinking on Valproic for Singap? Uh, what is my experience on Valproic? Yeah, good Singap. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't have really, really good experience uh, with with Valproic, but. Uh, Again, maybe it's uh, because when when you have a, a drug uh, which uh, you are starting with with uh, this drug always, like valproic acid, you know very well the the bad side of this drug. So uh, I because I'm a second opinion center, so I always see the bad side of valproic. Patients normally come to me after Valproic. <laughs> so because of that, I, I have that uh, bad experience. So maybe it's not a bad drag. <laughs> uh, uh, Angel, could, do you mind if I, can you stop presenting just so we get more faces and less screen? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great, Sorry. thank you. Um, yeah. So a lot of questions are coming in and I'm thrilled to see three, at least three SRF board members here. If anybody wants to talk live, um, Please just let me know. Um, but I want to I want to go to Hans's first question because it's a really good one. Do any other genetic epilepsies have a similar EEG profile to Syngap? How related question because Hans thinks about biomarkers. How unique is EEG in Syngap? 
So I would say is is not unique. So uh, for example, uh, CHD2, which is also a, another genetic epilepsy quite common uh, among the rare epilepsies, uh, you you can see really really similar EEGs. Also, we we had uh, the last the last week uh, another patient with. Uh, this this kind of EEG patterns, and uh, he had a TBR1 uh, mutation. So we have some genes uh, which could uh, show like like Singa one but you know it's more about probabilities. If you have this syndrome, you have the probability to find this and this and this and this. So it's not a, the whole uh, spectrum of, of genes. Got it. And then Nancy's asking two great questions too. First is, does the video EEG pick up on the eyelid myoclonic seizures? And, I, and I'll just add to that personal editorial. We get a lot of parents who go into the hospital with the button and they press the button. And I can't tell you how many doctors say to the parents, when you press the button, nothing happened. And the parents were like, no, I pressed the button because the there was stuff and the doctors like, no, when you press the button and when the stuff was happening at different times. And so I, I wonder if that's, I don't know what Nancy's, what's behind Nancy's question, but does the video EEG always pick up on the eyelid myoclonic seizures is, is what she's asking. I would say yes, in my experience. Uh, I, I cannot tell uh, my colleagues experience. I don't know, but yeah. No, but uh, I think it's, it's a, uh, like a very typical signature, so it's it's difficult to to lose an I I I lead myoclonia, uh, yeah. And then maybe it's more of the absence that I'm thinking about because I we also have like when a when a when a child starts showing delays and having absence seizures ages two and three, you know something happens. Somebody orders an EEG. They go to the hospital. The EE, the, and, and then this is a conversation I know a lot of people have had. The doctor says, it wasn't a seizure. There was some abnormal activity, but it wasn't a seizure. And the parents are like, <laughs> I'm still not sure what that means. So um, how would you explain that? And then, and then what I say to them is come back in six to 12 months and suddenly it's a seizure, right? It's, it's almost like it's, it's, it's slowly progressing from okay to seizure but because what nancy's second question is you know her first one was like what martha said what is the best recommended medication and how do you convince people that your kid's actually having a seizure sorry and all the, all these hard questions yeah, yeah yeah no 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 it's it's nice and uh, it's it's also uh, teaching for me to 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 have these questions uh I, I certainly, I, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, we have to rely more in families uh, in general, because for rare diseases, you know more about your kid than we know. So that's, that's for sure. My, my professor, when I started in the world of, of epilepsy, he told me that uh, at the beginning, you know, Dravet syndrome is, is very famous, is, is the most uh, popular uh, among the genetic epilepsies. And Dravet uh, syndrome is very typical for uh, excitation trigger seizures and also uh, to febrile, febrile fever uh, trigger seizures. So my professor told me, uh, uh, Dr. Hilnagel, my mentor, he told me that at the beginning, they didn't uh, believe the families. They, they thought the families were creating that relationship uh, between fever and seizures or excitation and seizures. So yeah, at the beginning, you have to, uh, I don't know, to fight, to uh, do things like this, to, to create uh, meetings among doctors and families. And uh, yeah, in the end, we have to be more horizontal in, in our relationship with families. I think that's something which is changing with the new generations of, of physicians, of neurologists. I hope so. Me too. Extending, extending to that, um, Angel, then we're talking about a, a family that 
got reported at abnormal EEG, that means that the lower, the threshold for seizures is lower, but they don't report seizures. And then how do you deal with that? Because that's the question we get all the time, because you know that kid is a, has, I mean, it's increased at risk for seizures. Do you treat that in SYNCAP knowing that 90% of the patients are gonna finish having through seizures or how do you deal with that? Yeah, so we, 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 there, is, there is also a cognitive bias for doctors. We call it uh, the tool bias that uh, mm, for a hammer, you only see, how, how do you call it, nail or? Yeah. yeah. So for, for physicians, we only see seizures because we only have anti-seizure medication. So we, we don't have uh, medications for the underlying uh, cause. Uh, so because of that, we are like very uh, concentrated on, on seizures. So because of that, sometimes we, we want to look to other side and, and don't see the, the EEG abnormalities. This is something also which is changing because, for example, in tuberous sclerosis, uh, which is another genetic epilepsy, uh, for the first time in history, uh, we have proved that if you have an abnormal EEG and you start medication, you can prevent epilepsy. This is, this is something which is the, the first time in, in the history of neurology because we, we couldn't uh, prove this before. But this, this is only for uh, tuberous sclerosis. We, 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 I don't know if we could make it for Singa Guam. We need more research on that. And, and to extend to that point, Mike and I were talking, uh, the older kids, um, there are a few of them. Of course, we don't have many teenagers that are transitioned to adulthood. But we have at least two patients, and I think three, thinking about the people that I know in Spain, that when they turn 16, 17, 18, they got worse. They, yeah, they, they start with the, the epilepsy. Then if there is any thought maybe of a, something that will protect the brain to, to progress to that. Yeah, you, you mean people uh, who uh, didn't have epilepsy and start uh, during teenage? They, they had, they on. yes. They had absence. They had pretty mild seizure phenotype. And then right around 16, 17, 18, 19, they, had, they presented with a big tonic clonic and they had to up all their meds a lot. Yeah, yeah. sometimes we, we see that. For sure, this is something we have to describe like the adult phenotype uh, of one, uh, yeah. And just for curiosity, what they are using for uh, tuberous sclerosis for prevention? By by gabapentin. By by gabapentin, Yeah, uh, I I don't think uh, it could work well for Singa one. It's it's another physiopathology. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, there's so many great questions here. So Nancy, Ka Nancy Kessler is asking another one. And just so you know, I hope you've seen that movie about Karen, the 65 year old patient. If you haven't, we'll send you a link. But we have, have. a 65, we have a 60, you have, okay, good. No, so no, Nancy, I have. I, you I haven't? Have. Oh, we'll, have. we'll, we'll, we'll send it to you. It's very, very yeah. good. <laughs> and her sister, Nancy, who's been caring for her for 65 years. So you could argue Nancy is probably one of the world's leading Syngap experts at this point. Um, and once she was diagnosed with Syngap, only last year at the age of 64, um, they, 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 that, that diagnosis helped them get under the care of Dr. Davinsky, who sees most of our patients in New York area. And, and, and she's saying, uh, Dr. Davinsky said that this, the activity can be very deep in the brain and may not always show. Karen shows abnormal activity and slowness. So just staying with this, this, this theme that we're hearing from patients of like, they don't know the Syngapians don't always present seizures on the EEG, but there's a certain kind of abnormal activity and slowness. And is that just normal for all encephalopathies or is that could that be something that is that we can agree is, is, is a Syngap signature? Because it's just and I'm only asking this because parents come out of meetings with neurologists confused. You know, the neurologist said there was no seizure. I know my kid has Syngap one. I know stuff is happening. I'm seeing eyelids move. 
and they said it was abnormal and slow. But no one understands what I don't, and other people do, I'm sure, but I'm, I don't understand what abnormal and slow means. Does, so, yeah, uh, again, uh, so normally in, in electroencephalography, we see like three, three different things. Uh, one thing is the background, uh, which is, could be normal or with a slowness, uh, as, as you were saying. One is uh, epileptiform activity with or without symptoms. And the third one is uh, seizures. So I leave my clonia, absences, tonic clonic, whatever. So the slow uh, background slowing, uh, this is something where we see in a lot of different uh, diseases. So it's, it's not anything which is uh, specific. Uh, this is something which is a little bit frustrating as well for doctors because it's uh, we know there has to be uh, something more specific for, for every genetic cause. And for example, we are starting a, a new research with our uh, with a university here in Madrid, which is trying to use uh, artificial intelligence, you know, deep, deep learning processing uh, to see uh, some signatures in, at the EEG that uh, we cannot quantify with, with the neurologist's eye. Uh, so this is something which could have uh, could give us uh, an answer on this. Uh, the problem with this kind of research is that you you have to uh, have a lot of uh, EEGs. So you you need like thirty patients with single one, uh, and uh, it's difficult to to get so many EEGs on a, a rare epilepsy like single one. That could be a project for the future. Yeah, I want I invited Sydney up from our board to ask a question. Her, she can tell you about her son, but he has a. I would love it actually, Sydney, if you could spend a minute talking about Emmett's presentation and all of the medications he's been on because he's a one of our serious cases. Go ahead, Sydney. Sure. Okay. Hi, Dr. Serrano. Thank you so much for the really informative webinar. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. um, we, can, so, we cannot see you. <laughs> we can hear you, but not see you. Okay, I'll, I'll move her over to panelists, and then we can see her. Um, mm -hmm. She has a lot of questions. She should have her. Oh. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so my child, Emmett, he's three and a half now, but I think um, Marta and Mike will agree with me that he's way on the severe side for epilepsy in SYNGAP1. And uh, much like you described the progression of epilepsy type and frequency that's seen in adults, I actually believe I've seen that in him already. From the time of six months, he was definitely having eyelid myoclonia. And by the time he was 12 to 14 months, um, the myoclonia went from several times a day where I thought I was crazy <laughs> to being you know, one to 200 times a day and having full body atonic drops, head drops, um, clonic jerking of the limbs as well. And all of this progressed within like six months, um, from six months to about 12 months. And at this point, I think we've been through uh, seven meds with um, having five of them at a time even, as well as keto diet plus meds. Um, and in every situation, I find he's just incredibly medication resistant. Uh, currently on five meds, he is still having at least 100 myoclonia a day with probably a dozen to 30 head drops as well. Um, and we just feel like <laughs> we don't know what to do, but it brings me to my question of, do you have a best guess for what mechanism or mechanisms are responsible for some of our kids being so resistant to medications and others who are treated with valproic acid and that's it? <laughs> yeah. So for sure, we don't know uh, yet, but uh, some hypotheses uh, we are exploring uh, are uh, other genetic variants, you know, like uh, there, is, there is something which is uh, being studied, which is the polygenic risk score. I don't know if you know it. Uh, it's something 
uh, which is not applied normally in, in clinical practice. But uh, we know if, that it, uh, probably if you have a high genet uh, uh, genetic uh, polygenic uh, risk score, probably your monogenic disease, Singac one or whatever, it, uh, it could be uh, more severe. So sometimes we are, we are speaking about the myth or the legend of uh, monogenic disease. So it's, it's not, uh, uh, th there, is not uh, there is no monogenic disease. So you have a mutation in Singac one, but you have a lot of uh, other genetic traits which are uh, modeling and changing the, the expression of, of this. And also other uh, uh, environment uh, factors, like, but we don't know uh, right now. For sure, for example, uh, the brain gut axis, uh, some behavioral aspects, educational family aspects, but we don't know. Sorry, okay. my, my answers are not so precise, but <laughs> this is what we have now. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's understandable. There's definitely a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So we're thankful for scientists who are doing what they can to help us understand how they all fit together. Um, my second question for you is, my neurologist has described my child's eyelid myoclonia sometimes as atypical absence, and then other times like as an eyelid myoclonia. And I've just been so confused by that. And I want to understand why is he calling it two different things? How do they overlap? And um, in that case where an eyelid myoclonia might be considered some kind of atypical absence, does that mean we should consider medications like ethosuximide, which are obviously useful for treatment of absence seizures? So, sorry, I did not understand. Uh, eyelid, eyelid myoclonia and what is the other? Typical absence. A typical yeah. yeah, so yeah, eyelid myoclonia is just the jerking of the eyelid, uh, which can be associated or not with the, the absence uh, seizure. So uh, the problem is sometimes uh, for all of the diseases uh, expressed with eyelid myoclonia, we know that they are going to be refractory. Uh, so uh, even people with mild syndromes with eyelid my myoclonia without intellectual disability uh, and without any other uh, 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 seizures, we, we see that they are really, really refractory. Uh, so we, we have not uh, good good medications for, for eyelid myoclonia. Sometimes we, I have a good experience with a Peram panel in some patients, uh, uh, with Barproic in some patients, with uh, Brivaracetam or Levetiracetam in some patients, uh, Estiripental maybe in, in, some, in some patients, but uh, they are yeah, mostly refractory. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's definitely been our experience. So maybe I'll just go out on a limb and ask you another hard question and yes. see what has your experience been recommending VNS or corpus callosotomy for your patients who are just so incredibly medication resistant? Mm. So yeah, definitely is not, uh, we, we don't have really, really great experience uh, with VNS and chiosotomy. Uh, chiosotomy, you have to choose very well the patient because you can decrease the, the cognitive uh, profile. Uh, and it's, it's only useful for atonic, for drop attacks. This is the only uh, efficacy. And uh, VNS, the good point is that it's not uh, very harmful. So it's, if it's not working, uh, it's not very harmful. And uh, yeah, the efficacy can be as one of the other medications. So sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not working. Okay. I really appreciate your honest and thoughtful answers. And thanks again so much for taking time to share with us. Hey? <laughs>
Thanks for your question. Yeah, Sydney. this is this is great. This is great. Um, thank you, Sydney. So, uh, Raymond Holden, if you're if you're reading along, Angel, and then yeah, I, think we have, I, think I have like five. I have like five minutes more because they are calling me from the video ED monitoring. <laughs> so, okay, but, so uh, let me let yeah, me be quick. Yeah. Um, Ray Holden says we have a 12 year old diagnosed nine years ago with drop an eyelid. Sodium valparate worked, but we still have myoclonic eyelids due to growth in puberty. Question, do you have any other ideas on adjuvants that might help cognition? And they've used Keppra and, and they also use CBD. So this is the, if I can extrapolate Ray, this is one of the challenges we have as parents, right? We pile on the end, we fight the seizures, we pile on the drugs, we see cognition slip. And then people start saying, "Are there? Is there any way to facilitate the cognition? Because ID is, you know, one of the yeah. underlying characteristics." So, um, yeah, the the best tool for cognitive is to to have the lowest medication. So, uh, if you if you see that with uh, four hundred uh, milligrams per day, uh, valproic acid is the same. Uh, for uh, seizure control as uh, 800 per day go down to 400 so the minimum the minimal dosage uh, that's that's one of the the main points the other is to try new medications we are, we we are trying this is something which is uh, starting now and we are in the middle of bureaucracy uh, war, you know, but uh, we are trying to perform a clinical trial uh, with fenfluramine, which is a new anti seizure medication, and we have really good experience uh, with it in in Dravet syndrome and in Lenos Gasto. So this is also a, a new tool to to try new medications. Is so, that going to be a basket trial? I heard I, I heard from that company. No, that we are going to no, we are going to uh, perform a specific trial in Singapore, but with with really few patients. Is is some one of maybe I, I shouldn't talk uh, about this, but <laughs> because it's something which is uh, uh, yeah uh, in the in the we are we are working on that, but uh, I hope uh, we can start that uh, in some months. So it's a specific trial in synaptopathies, STX BP1 and SYNGAC1. Please let us know if we can help. We, we work closely with STX BP1 here in the States, and I, I, I know exactly the company you're talking with, and we are very excited about that drug. So that, that study is, is important, and we I, agree. I hope that's working. <laughs> Angel, that. before you go, I, I really want you to answer the question of uh, Encarnacion. She has a a hard case of her daughter. Uh, she's from Spain. And uh, her daughter started having bad seizures at eight of 18 and she really lost. She, she used to walk and everything and be very active. And now she's in a wheelchair and her question is, how much she will recover? Or what is your question about recovering? About recovery after motor uh, worsening? Oh. Or? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, after, yeah. But the, the motor worsening was after seizure uh, onset or? Yes, I understand that she got worse. And, and yeah, I may connect you later on with that carnation. But yeah, she has been very worried because her daughter used to walk and be very functional. And now she's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So there is always hope when something uh, was in the past and it, it has been lost because of seizures, because seizures can be treated. So we have some experiences uh, with uh, coming back to walk, coming back to talk, uh, and uh, all of that uh, with uh, a better seizure managing. So there is always hope if uh, uh, the problem is seizures. Yeah. Thank you. There was one last question, and it says, how important is genetic testing? Is it useful? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we need it. We need it. Uh, we need to perform genetic testing, and all uh, genetic testings are not created equal. So we need 
good genetic te testing. So, because now we have the problem that a lot of patients uh, come to our clinic with genetic testing, but you look at them and they are really bad uh, testing. So we have to update the genetic testing each uh, two or three years. So if you have a negative genetic testing, you, you should repeat it after two or three years. And, and linking to that question, what about we get parents that get denied the EEGs and the MRIs for a long time after diagnosis? How often do you recommend they should get EEGs? And how often you should get MRIs or just the starting MRI and then no more? So for MRI, if it's a SINGAC1 or a genetic epilepsy, well, SINGAC1, yeah. It, it's not necessary to repeat it. Uh, I would only repeat it if something really different happens. So in that situation, I, I would repeat it. But normally, it's OK with one MRI. We, we, we don't need to repeat it. For EEG monitoring, I would repeat it um, quite often. It could be once a year, or once per six months, or once uh, per seizure change. So if you have a cognitive uh, worsening, if you have a seizure change, uh, you should repeat an EEG. And as long as you can. If, if one hour is better than 30 minutes, two hours is better than 30 minutes, uh, four hours is better than two hours. Thank you. I know you've got to go. Yeah. So Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm sorry for my English. I, I, I know it's not so fluent, but uh, I try my best. <laughs> this is great. This has really been valuable, and I think a lot of families will watch it and benefit. So thank you. Thank you all. Hope to yeah. see you soon in person. Yeah, and good luck with that trial. Anything we can do. We, okay. That's an important trial. Thank you. Bye. Thank Mil gracias, Angel. Adios. Gracias. Adios.